Welcome to Opal TV. I am in London, in the West End of London, together with Paul Horton, who has founded and runs Durvent Capital. Now, you may not know Durvent Capital, but you may have heard of the Twitter hedge fund. So Durvent Capital is the Twitter hedge fund set up by Paul. And Paul, tell me, what is your background and how did you get the idea to set sure. up a hedge fund based on Twitter? My background, I've worked in finance now for five, six years. I work for a big foreign exchange bank, a Danish foreign exchange bank, but I've always had a, a passion for quantitative trading strategies. And I decided to set up my own business two and a half years ago when I set up Derwent Capital to use some quantitative trading strategies that I developed successfully myself and apply them to private managed accounts for high net worth individuals. So I started trading these quantitative trading strategies that I developed successfully and applying them to private managed accounts for high net worth and ultra high net worth individuals. And the business grew very, very quickly. And I reached the point where I wanted to expand the business and managing private accounts is there's a limit to how many accounts you can manage effectively. So I made the decision to actually set up a, a hedge fund, which ultimately has a lot of scalability. And at the time, I came across an article on Bloomberg titled Twitter Predicts the Stock Market. This is going back to October 2010. And it really caught my eye. I was very intrigued by the, the paper. And I looked into the paper in a lot more detail. It was an academic paper that was written by Professor Johan Bollen and two co-authors. And Professor Bollen works out of Indiana University. And what he'd done is he wanted to see if there was a correlation between global sentiment on Twitter, derived from Twitter, and the Dow Jones Industrial Average Index. So for example, he wanted to see that if the Dow tumbled two, three hundred points, do we see a downturn in sentiment in the global in, in terms of global raw sentiment? And what he found was a stunning find that in fact there was a very high correlation between sentiment on Twitter and the Dow Jones. But what they found was very interesting. Imagine if you've got a curve, you've got a curve of the Dow and then a mood curve effectively, which they're generating. They had to shift the mood curve forward by three days to overlap the Dow Jones Industrial Average Index. So in other words, what that meant was that the, 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 the change in sentiment on Twitter was three days ahead of the Dow Jones. So it was an amazing discovery. And even to this day, we still don't fully understand the, the correlation between that, why we see that correlation, but we're starting to understand it in a bit more detail. So I got in touch with, with Johan, we met, it was quite fortunate actually, I was on vacation in Barbados over Christmas and New Year and Johan was in um, St. Lucia. So we, we met up on Boxing Day, had a whole day together on the beach, really spent a lot of time to understand a lot more about what he was doing and what we were doing. Johan was looking at ways to commercialise this technology. We obviously found it extremely valuable for, for, from terms of generating an edge and generating alpha for our fund. So we, we signed an exclusive license agreement between ourselves, Indiana University and Johan. We've got patent on the technology and we've been trialling it now for over six months. The results continue to be outstanding in the sense that we're able to predict the daily direction of the Dow with an 80 to 90% accuracy. So we've now launched the Do an Absolute Return Fund Limited, which is a fund domiciled in the Cayman Islands. Our initial offer period started on the 13th of May. Investors are now subscribing for shares as we speak, and trading actually commenced last Friday, the 1st of July. So um, we've got a lot, of, a lot of interest, a lot of people excited about the fund, and we just can't wait to, um, to start releasing some results. This is a fantastic story, congratulations, Paul. And I would say this is what they call in economy and in technical analysis, they would, this is what they classically would call a leading indicator. Mm. So my question to you now is, where is this leading indicator or your mood that comes from Twitter? 
where is it calculated? How do you elicit the signal? Are you doing it? Is Johan doing it? And particularly, how do you do it? We All the technology, the actual hardware infrastructure is currently housed on Indiana University's infrastructure, their internal university infrastructure. I mean, it's quite a lot of computing power required because if you think about it, with Twitter now, you have a billion tweets a, a week about 200 million a day. So it's a huge volume of, of data to analyze. So the raw data feed, the raw Twitter feed, comes directly from, from Twitter into the university system. And then that computer system is then analyzing that data in real time, looking for keywords associated with a specific mood state. Now, we, we measure six different mood states. Uh, for example, happy, anxious, calm, sad. And each mood state has its own lexicon of keywords associated with that mood state. Once uh, the, the raw data is being filtered for, for the prevalence of these certain keywords, that data is then felt, fed into a, an algorithm developed by Johan. And, it, and the output from that is a, a chart, a simple graph that we see. A daily, uh, it's updated daily at the moment. We have the ability to actually do it hourly, but at the moment we're working on daily. So, for example, I'll come into the office on a, say, a Tuesday morning. We work on standard deviations. So we're actually looking for not necessarily where sentiment is, but where sentiment is today from where it was yesterday. So if I come into the office on a Tuesday morning and I see a, a standard deviation or more drop in sentiment from Monday, that to me is a signal that we're going to see a downturn in the global the macro equity markets in the next two to three days, two to four days. So by Thursday to Friday of that week, we should see the FTSE, the Dow, the S&P 500 starting to come off. So the, the technology is, is physically housed in Indiana. We're actually looking at replicating a system as we speak here in London. The two will run parallel for a while, and then eventually we'll flick off Indiana and move it completely over to the London base. Do you just filter English language uh, messages, Twitter tweets, or are you multi-language? And the second question would be, how do you then execute a trade once you know where the mood is heading? Twitter is obviously a US company based in California, so the, the bulk of the Twitter sphere, if you like, base of, of, of customers or users is English speaking. So the initial academic paper that Johan wrote was based on English language. However, he's now developed that for seven other languages, major, major global uh, languages as well. So we, we feed all that data into our algorithms as well, because it's, it's global sentiment that we're trying to monitor, not any specific region at this stage. So going back to what I said earlier, say, use the example of I come into the office on a Tuesday morning, we've seen a big, big drop in sentiment. Say on our anxious mood state, we're down two and a half standard deviations, which would be fairly significant. What I would then do with our portfolio is I would then start to construct a nice diverse portfolio basket of instruments, liquid, highly liquid instruments that are correlated to the global markets. So for example, the major indices, so near dated future contracts on the S&P 500, the Dow Jones, the FTSE 100, and also some of the constituents within the FTSE 100 index as well, some of the most liquid companies, the Vodafones, the Tesco's, etc. So we're not specifically stock picking, we're just trying to buy a nice diverse basket of instruments or sell a diverse basket of instruments that when we see that downturn in the global markets, will correlate and, and then we'll, we'll see our um, our profits. Are you just taking the Twitter messages that come from Wall Street or from London City or from the CEOs of major corporations or are you literally taking all of them? Yeah, it's another very good question. In fact, a Nobel Prize winning academic actually asked Johan and said, surely you are taking, analyzing Twitter from as you say, CEOs, traders, people who are involved with the financial services industry, because you'll get a better, a more accurate data set or more relevant data set. And the answer is no, we don't. We take the entire Twitter sphere. So we take everything from someone tweeting about Justin Bieber to what they did at the weekend. Because you've got to remember what we're measuring is, is actually nothing to do with the world of finance. We're just measuring that raw sentiment on a, on a huge scale. 
how do people feel at this moment in time? Are they happy? Are they sad? Are they nervous? Etc. So, no, we take the entire Twitter sphere. So, Paul, what would happen to your model and to your indicator on a day, let's say, when Michael Jackson died, which was obviously a global event and for a lot of people a surprise and a negative event, mm. but still maybe not that correlated really to the Dow or to the financial markets. Yeah. So how does your model deal with that? I think the first point to make, which is very important, is that this isn't a, a straight through process. Right? It's not a, a black box trading strategy. So. You know, if we get a sentiment signal, that's not then taken on by our trading systems and then a trade executed. The way to explain how we use this is it's a tool. It's, it gives us color on the markets in a way that we've never before ha been able to, to, to have. So in an instance where, for example, the death of Michael Jackson, which is a huge global event, and there's no doubt it will be a, there will be a negative effect on global sentiment, we obviously keep abreast of the news channels, the major news channels as well. And that's another tool, an avenue that we're monitoring all the time. So when we do see a spike in sentiment, we saw one before the Japanese earthquake, which we can come on to later. But using the Michael Jackson example, we'd see that spike in negative sentiment. But then we would then cross-check that or validate it against perhaps some major global events that are happening. And, and we can also look at the, the, the specific keywords that are triggering that sentiment spike. So if we find that it's, it's something to do with Michael Jackson, which isn't going to have any effect on the financial markets or very, very little, then we can decide not to execute that trade or act on that signal. So all in all, that's all a very intriguing approach. Tell me more, Paul, about the whole setup of your company. You know, who else is on the team and also how do you do your risk management? We're a London-based firm. We're regulated by the UK Financial Services Authority. Derwent Capital Markets is the investment manager to the Derwent Absolute Return Fund, which is domiciled in the Cayman Islands. So in terms of your basic operational structure, the service providers to the fund, PwC, PricewaterhouseCoopers are the auditors, Reed Smith, big American law firm. We use IG Markets, who I've used for a long, long time as our broker. So they execute our, all our trades. We, we actually trade a, an instrument called a CFD, a, a contract for difference, which is just a derivative of the indices or, or the equity instruments. We use Contillion in, in Ireland, in Dublin, as our, our, our administrator, and we use Walkers in Cayman as Cayman Council. So they're all the major service providers. London-based operation, we have offices in, in Barclay Square and our main office here in Wimbledon Park. We're principally a family. The, the business was set up as a, as a family-owned business. So it's myself, my brother Simon. We have two people in our investor relations team now who are looking after all our new onboarding, the onboarding process for new investors. Obviously, Johan himself and, and Huina, his um, co-inventor, heading up our R&D team. So they're working on developing the, the strategy, the actual raw algorithm, the sentiment analysis, and they're looking to improve that all the time and develop it. We have a, a head of IT and systems that works here from our London office as well. And in terms of compliance and risk, that's managed between myself and my brother. I actually use um, an Excel VBA-based system, which I developed myself for all our risk analysis. So I have systems in there which are, which warn me if we reach certain levels on, on a trade size or if we have certain volatility levels picking up in the markets. So that's a system that we've developed ourselves internally. Hi, Paul. You've been trading live now for three days. How were your first three days? Three days. We started on Friday the 1st of July. It was our first trade. Nothing too exciting, I have to say. All we've done, we've put our currency hedge trades on because we have four different currency classes, share classes. So we're just hedging that, uh, that risk. But we're starting to see some interesting signals coming through this week. So I think our first sort of big trade, if you like, will be going on towards the end of this week. The equity markets, as we speak, the FTSE is just over 6,000. Dow's at 12,600. We've seen a strong recovery with the Greek bailout. But we're starting to see some, um, some negativity come back into our sentiment analysis. So we're actually looking at seeing um, some downside to the markets.
Twitter is obviously one of the very successful new social media platforms. Now, going forward, looking to the future, do you think that all the social media platforms that still keep on evolving, Google has now put one out, for example, do you see that they continue to impact or will impact more and more the financial markets or the finan or asset management? Yeah, I think I don't think they'll have a direct impact on the financial markets, but in their I think social media is here to stay. There's no doubt about it. it it's it's Facebook has been around for, for five five years now, five six years. Twitter the same. They're growing in in scale and volume all the time. We're seeing similar social media platforms in, in China as well. And I mean, China's enormous. So yeah, it's certainly here to stay. And I think we're going to see more and more financial in firms or asset managers using that data because it's extremely valuable and it's extremely large scale. So I think this is certainly a trend that will be here to stay. And I don't think it'll be long if, if it's not happening already. Certainly if we when we start producing results, positive results, people will take it more seriously and realize how valuable it is. And I think some of the big institutions will start to set up teams and invest uh, developing technologies around social media. And I think it really boils down to one of the very, very old principles of investments is that markets, it's certainly in the short term, are driven by greed and fear. And we've never really had a way before to, to measure or quantify greed and fear. If you define a market, a market in, in, in itself is just a huge gathering of people buying and selling assets between each other based on what price they think is fair. But if you can take an enormous audience and really and kind of listen to what each one of them is saying through a supercomputer and then, and then being able to, to see how they're feeling at any one moment in time, there's no doubt that that gives you a really significant edge above above anyone else, any one individual within that market or in that collective audience. So yeah, I really do think it's here to stay and it's an exciting sort of secondary use of social media, I think. Paul, right, this is of course a cutting edge technology. So I'm curious, who is invested in your fund right now and, and also which groups are expressing interest in your fund? As you'd expect, we're a startup fund, so our early investors are, the majority are high net worth private individuals or ultra high net worth individuals. They have the ability to invest in, in small startups, there's, there's less due diligence required. So the makeup of our investors, the initial 25 million sterling that we've raised, the bulk of that has, has come from private individuals. The There is money invested from family offices as well and also a small, well, reasonably sized fund of funds. Having said that, we've had a huge amount of publicity over the last six months as well. And as a result, we've had a tremendous amount of inquiries from some very, very large organizations, some of the biggest money managers you know, there are. But we, we appreciate that you know, we are a small operation and we've got to go out there and deliver first. So what I say to these big particularly institutional money, is look, by all means, let's develop a relationship, let's establish a relationship, let's um, keep you in the loop with our performance and, uh, and, and the development of the fund, but let's just get let's get our fund underway. There's been a lot of hype, a lot of talk about us. I, I, you know, I like to just to practice what I preach rather than you know, just talk the talk. So I want to get out there, hit some good numbers on the board, see our assets grow nice and organically, Target, achieve. We're trying to target 10 to 15 percent annual return with a nice low volatility. So at that stage, we can then start talking to some of the bigger, more serious money managers, and hence that's when our our AUM will will start to hit 50, 100, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Obviously, capacity is not an issue given the instruments that you trade, which are all liquid futures. Yeah, or? yeah, it's something we've looked at actually. I've done some analysis on, you know, how how much money we can actually put into the market effectively and the beauty is because we're looking at that real global sentiment that global macro market move the instruments that we're trading have tremendous depth and liquidity so there is really no limit in terms of certainly up to a billion two billion pound dollar fund it isn't going to be an issue
Paul, you said when you set up your fund and when you started your cooperation with Johan, you also set up a demo account and you did some paper trades. How was the performance? How did you do? Yeah, shortly after we met Johan back in um, on Boxing Day over Christmas, it wasn't long before we had access to the live sentiment analysis feed. So the first thing we wanted to do was to start to actually trial the strategy on demo trading account, which IG kindly provided with us. So we had £10 million of effectively paper money, which we set up on February 13th this year. And we've been running that now for yeah, nearly five months, um, obviously to, to the 1st of July. And we're up 7.2% on that account which is interestingly in line with what we were looking to achieve our target is 10 to 15 percent annual return for our investors that's net of uh, of fees and that's it's, it's given us a lot of confidence that we've been able to achieve that from our trials so yeah it's a very very exciting time not just for us but for, for the industry as a whole because as i said there's a lot of people watching this fund and i just i'm just very excited about being up and running now and um, can't wait till the 1st of August when we release our first figures. 